Welcome to the Best Team Wins podcast with Adam Robinson. He's talking to today's industry leaders and entrepreneurs about the people side of their business. Welcome to the Best Team Wins podcast, where we feature entrepreneurs and business leaders whose exceptional approach to the people side of their business has led to incredible results. My name is Adam Robinson, and for the next 25 minutes, I'll be your host as we explore how to build your business through better hiring. Today on the program, Lee Carraher is the founder and CEO of Double Forte, a national public relations and digital marketing agency uh, located in San Francisco, although Lee splits her time between San Francisco and New York, which sounds like a whole lot of late night flights. Uh, <laughs> she's the founder and CEO, founded in 2002. She's currently got 35 staff members uh, and is doing some pretty amazing things. Uh, Lee, we are so excited to have you here. Thanks for being on the show. Adam, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be with you. Uh, some fun facts. Uh, after a 100% failure rate, losing six millennial employees within three months, hired and lost within 90 days, which is uh, impressive uh, just uh, on its face. Um, after recognizing this failure uh, and, and learning a, a lot about managing uh, this new generation of the workforce, you've developed a whole lot of content, high-performing mm -hmm. intergenerational teamwork and, and work environment where people choose to stay uh, for longer than 90 days, which is... <laughs> or 91, is, 92. Which is good, you know, you know <laughs> clear, that, clear that bar. Uh, and your company, Double Forte, has a podcast called Millennial Minded, which we'll talk about here. Um, but before we jump in, give us 30 seconds on what you're doing at Double Forte. Sure. So Double Forte, like you said, is a national public relations and digital marketing influencer marketing firm. We're headquartered in San Francisco. We have offices in New York and people around the country. And we work with consumer lifestyle, digital life, and professional services companies to help them tell their story to people who matter to them. Um, we choose to work with people who are doing great positive things in their categories. So we leave a lot of money on the table, but we have a better life for it. All right. And if listeners want to learn more, what's the best way for them to do that? If you want to learn more about Double Forte, go to double-forte.com and you can see all about the agency, our services, and the clients we've served over the last 16 years. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, I want to hear about this story. You you hired and lost six uh, staff members mm -hmm. in 90 days. Uh, take us through that. So when I started my company in 2002, we only hired people with 10 years of experience, which by definition, they were probably like 31, 32 minimum, right? Mm -hmm. And then after two, in 2008, when everything went south, uh, I think it's always really important to look at a business model when things go south, either on this micro level at your own company or in the macro level like this was in 2008, 2009 and the implosion of the economy. And when I did that, I realized, wow, we're going to run out of people with 10 years of experience pretty soon because it in San Francisco, uh, between 2000 and 2004, almost nobody got hired into my discipline. So I think it's important to bring people always at the bottom of your qualifications into your system. And I, oh my gosh, we have this big donut hole that's about to happen. It'll be like a five-year donut hole where there's nobody with just 10 years of experience. So based on that, and then sort of looking at how expensive people are with 10 years of experience... <laughs> Yeah, in San I, Francisco and New York, you're not at the we're not, bottom we, of the labor rate exactly, scale. Exactly. You know, I was like, well, we have to, um, what we'll do, we'll just bring, you know, new employees into our space. And I thought nothing of it because of my previous two jobs I'd had over in at uh, my, my job before I started my company, I'd had over 700 people and 80% of them were under 30. And then the job before that, I'd had 670-ish people. And like 90% of them were under 30. So I was like, oh, I'm good at this. No problem. Hired my first millennial. Didn't know what a millennial was. And the first day she brought her dog to work, which in itself. I love it. I was love not it. A, I, and I was, I was at a meeting and I came in later that day. I sort of showed up at like 1030 that day. And there's this dog, you know, welcoming me at the door. I'm like, what's, who, whose dog is this? And, oh, that's Stephanie's dog. I'm like, uh-huh. And did we know Stephanie was bringing a dog? No. Did she ask if she could bring the dog? No. Is anybody allergic to dogs? I don't know. Oh, well, let's find that out first. And uh, so I go to my office, and I'm sort of like, what is the dog? And I realize, uh, then her boss comes in. And he goes, okay, the dog, uh, no one's allergic to dogs. The dog's name is Czar. And Lee, um, Czar is a service dog. So, mm -hmm. you know, right? Well, Zara is a chihuahua and 
I was like, what? <laughs> what just happened? And not only did uh, she bring the dog, she brought the dog's bed, the dog's water filtration system, and a kibble dispenser. So this dog was going nowhere, right? Right. Until 3.30 when I came out of my office. I'm like, oh, where's the new girl with the dog? Oh, she left. I'm like, what do you mean she left? Yeah, she had to go to San Diego today to see her mom. I'm like, and she won't be here tomorrow. I'm like, did she ask if she could leave early? Did she tell us she was leaving early? Did she tell us she wasn't going to come in for the second day of her new job? No, 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 no. So I called my friend and I was like, this just happened. And you're like, oh my God, ladies, millennials are terrible. I'm like, what's a millennial? Okay. So uh-huh. we sorted out Stephanie. She's fantastic. She actually runs digital marketing now for um, uh, PWG. It's tremendous, right? <clears throat> and then it took a while because we were recovering from this downturn. Uh, and then all this, we had the capacity, we built it back up and we were able to hire six uh, young people at the same time. And basically we hired six people within six or seven weeks of each other, mm-hmm. all between 22 and 28 years old. And they were all gone within three months of the first one coming in. And I had never had a hundred percent failure in retaining people. So I was like, okay, we have a really good hiring process. We got great people. And I know it's not our process. I know it's not the people. What it, it must be us. It must be me is basically because one person can be bad, but all six couldn't be bad. So I started researching it and I recalled my dog experience, right? And I uh, started researching it and everything was so negative about millennials. And I here I had just changed the business model to say, if we don't have a millennial, we don't have a future. And everything was so negative about these people. So um, instead of paying attention to anything that had been written, I went about trying to figure it out myself with my team um, and did a lot of interviews, did a lot of trial and error and basically sort of crack the code on how we could have a positive intergenerational workplace um, just through that process in the, in the work, in the process of my communication work, you know, basically I think leadership is communication. I think relationships to communication, I think marketing is communication. So we're sort of right dead center in the thing of it. Um, our clients starting to have the same sort of problems that I had experienced in my own agency about retention for the younger workforce. And I started consulting with them and helping them uh, crack the code with them. And from that, I wrote my first book, Millennials in Management, um, because, uh, because, well, actually, they were I was asked to write it. And I was like, oh, no, I'll buy that. And um, But OK, I've always wanted to write a book. Um, And so in that book, I share sort of what we learned very, very, very hard way um, in a very pragmatic way. How's the book doing? Very well. I can imagine. It's done very, in fact, my second book, which is called The Boomerang Principle, which is about, which is basically how to have lifetime loyalty from employees who don't work for you anymore. Uh, When that came out uh, a year ago, my first book like shot right back up to the number one spot in its category again. So, you know sort of all in the same vein about the future of work and the future of work teams. Um, Cause it's a whole different uh, environment than the one that I grew up in, in my career. So, you know, as a fellow Gen Xer, I assume. Uh, Actually I'm a boomer. I'm the last year of boomer. All right. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, well, I'm seven, I'm 42. So I'm, I'm like You're Gen X. Yeah. smack in the middle of the yes. smallest generation, the Correct. least loved of all. So uh, true. We've done nothing special. There was no world wars we fought and we're not, a, <laughs> you know. The, but the, you were independent and latchkey kids who could make your own snacks. Just we are. <laughs> and, 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 you know, we grew up figuring out how to, you know, if we wanted to play games, we type basic into a computer, compiled that code <laughs> and played it by God. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's all good. Um, What would you say in your experience in your business is the difference you have to employ in hiring and and evaluating fit for the 10 plus years of experience folks when you started and now the entry workforce now born after 1980? What's Mm -hmm. what do you do? different? I think from the um, the filters are the same. Do the people have initiative? Can they write a sentence? Because that's really important to us. Um, are they team players as demonstrated by how they answer some questions and how they can, um, talk about how they've worked with other people in terms of, uh, that, that filter stays the same in terms of how you work together as a team that looks very different today than it did, uh, before. And that really is around, um, shared agreements, uh, high input, low democracy, 
tremendous amount of context and understanding um, everybody having a, a tremendous understanding over their own role and how their own role impacts the team and how the team impacts the company, how the company impacts that bottom line. So um, just a lot more communication around, this is why you work here. This is what we want you to do. This is why it's important. And then layering on top of that is, what do you want to do? How, what skills do you want to get? And how can we marry those two things, a function that we have to fill and a career that you want to build? And how do you have those relationships that allow you to sort of achieve two goals at the same time? And what I found is when you do that, uh, people stay longer than they thought they were going to stay um, and they learn more. And then when they leave you, they're very happy that they came to you because everyone's going to leave you. You know, as soon as you hire someone, you know, they're going to leave. The question is, when do they leave? So it's good for them to leave. Not that it's bad for that. Not, not running from you, but running to something good. Well, let's let's talk about that in the context of your book. Mm-hmm. Um, how, how do we as employers set up relationships that transcend the employment experience? I mean, that, mm-hmm. uh, you know, someone said today, uh, I was at a, a presentation today and the, and the speaker said, um, we don't we don't want to create terrorists in the marketplace with bad employee experiences yeah. after they leave. I mean, I, I so think uh, how how do businesses build those relationships beyond the payroll yeah. um, tenure? So I think there's a couple of things. One is there are bad apples and bad apples are bad apples. You can't do anything about them except get rid of them. Right. So not everybody is going to work out for you and you're not going to work out for everybody else. However, um, if you think about, if you can put a different framework around it, um, and this is, you know, something you people who are my age and older sort of have to get used to, which is everybody who leaves you, like you said, can hurt you or help you, and you should do everything you can to have them help you. And so a few things, is, a few things work in that way. One is while they're with you, that you help them achieve their goals in the context of your own business. That requires a relationship. I, you know, Adam, what do you want to do in your career? Well, I want to be a nurse. Well, we don't do that here. So if you want to be a nurse and you have to go to nursing school, you can work here. Uh, Sure, you can be employed here and we'll figure that out. But what it requires is that you do the job and then we'll accommodate you in the hours and we'll figure it out together. Um, And as long as you're holding up your end and we're holding up our end, then it sounds good. Um, knowing that you're not going to stay, knowing that that this is not what you want to do, but you can fulfill a role. Um, or to say, uh, someone says, I want to be a vice president. Um, and I'll say, oh, well, well, Sally, you've got a long way to go, but absolutely, let's put you on the vice president track. And this is what that means. And let me be just very honest with you. This means more than a 40 hour week. This means that you're doing lots of reading. This means that you're going to go do some skill building and da, da, da. And I think it's probably three or four years away, but you know, if you work hard, I promise that I'll work hard for you too. Um, to have those kind of conversations, as long as performance is high, you know, these are productive conversations so that when people decide to go, which they all will do, that they decide to go and they're happy for the experience that they had. And then you have to keep them in the fold, right? So the most important thing I think any company can do is to create an alumni program that they administer, not some rogue thing on LinkedIn, but that they administer an alumni program for everybody who's ever been at your company, no matter how big the company is, truly five people, 5,000 people, 50,000 people, 100,000 people. Um, and that you're in constant relationship with the people that used to be with you. And it's pretty easy to do. Um, you can set up a, you know, you can set up a private Facebook group to do it. I wouldn't do it on LinkedIn. It's too open. You could do it by email. You could do it, you know, doing by thing, things. But if you allow people to be stay connected to you, because people do, people want to stay connected to the things that meant, that meant something to them. Uh, and if you facilitate that, uh, that's one way to keep people attached to you, no matter where they are. Because in the end, we want loyalty. And it, I think the the wrong thing to think about is, you know, oh, I want, you know, I want people who are loyal to me. If they leave me, they're dead to me. Well, no, uh, it's actually not a loyal act to show up if you're getting paid, right? Right. That's a transaction. A yeah. loyal act is when you don't have to do anything. You're not expecting a quid pro quo. And you're out there in the market and go, you know what, Adam should talk to this person. His business would do so well with that person. I'm going to connect them. I don't need anything from that. I just, I know Adam, I know Jolie, and then we're going to put them together, right? 
or, you know, that kind of thing. And when you have that kind of relationship and expectation, you feed it with information and with a network and um, with some, you know, some coddling, meaning you're, you're connecting people. Then um, my experience is, is that those people go out into the world and they, they bring back their, um, their thankfulness to you because you help them achieve their goals. And sometimes it means they come all the way back as boomerang employees. And sometimes it just means that they um, don't say anything bad about you. <laughs> I love that. But, uh, how do you in, in the, the company uh, that you've built, how do you ensure that, that your line managers, your leaders that are helping make all the things happen, follow a consistent process with evaluating talent? I mean, it sounds like you spend a lot of time on this. How, how are you training first-time leaders to... Mm-hmm be first time leaders from a talent perspective? First time leadership is just so hard, right? And um, it, what I know from um, my own work and my own experience is that leadership development starts on day one and you should not wait for people to become like technical managers before you start leading, you know, showing how people lead. Uh, millennials in, in, in general, what uh, my experience with them is that they believe they can lead from any seat in the boat, and sometimes they'll be the leader, and sometimes they'll be the row over, and sometimes, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So starting leadership development from the beginning um, in um, self-accountability and leading yourself, and then leading with the team and leading, you know, that kind of thing is super, super important. Um, It is hard to do, and when you make that transition from individual performer, individual contributor to manager, explaining and showing people how they now are responsible for other people's performance yeah. is like the big shock, right? Let me let me tell you <laughs> that your ability to have friends at work is now gone away. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I have, you know, you talked about my millennial minded podcast. I think we probably got 10 episodes specifically on that topic because it's just so hard for, it's just so hard. Yeah. Um, the, at the same yeah. time, at the same time, the, the, you know, they're able to keep each other accountable much easier than, in my experience, Gen Xers and boomers ever were. Because they can just go, dude, you dropped the ball. Everybody, you know, literally, this is the conversations I hear. Hey, hey, you dropped the ball. What was that? You made us all hurt. Don't do that again, okay? Oh, man, I'm so sorry. Where you and I would have been like agonizing for days, like, oh, oh yeah, go talk to Joe when I got to say know. this and I got to say that. And meanwhile, they're just like, dude, you dropped the ball. Stop it. The you know? conflict <laughs> avoidant PC generation that we are as Gen X. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you can't say that to someone. Exactly. Which is a mistake, right? Yes. As soon as yeah. you so- find yourself, I think, as soon as you find yourself like trying to strategize how to confront someone, you know you're in the wrong pond take yourself out of that pond and just go have a conversation. Um, and actually in both of my books, I talk about how to have those fruitful conversations in a structured way that helps people who would just, you know, perseverate about it instead of getting it done, like use a process to get through it. Well, let, let's, let's spend a minute on that. I mean, how, how, how do uh, your leaders have coaching conversations? What's the formula? Well, like, I think the um, coaching conversation for positive reinforcement is very different than a coaching conversation for uh, correction or for conflict, you know, conflict resolution, right? Mm -hmm. So one, for the positive reinforcement, we get really specific. We do not just say, hey, great job, because what can anybody do with that? Nothing. Um, So for instance, um, on Tuesdays is our staff meeting and everybody rotates through doing a presentation so they can get experience in presenting in front of a group. And then we assign two people randomly to critique, right? Uh, One person gives the positive reinforcement and one person gives the corrective reinforcement. And the positive reinforcement is very specific. You used your arms in a very good way, right? You had good eye contact. Do that again so that it can't just be great job because you wouldn't know what to build on. But it's very specific. You know, I uh, like the way you did your PowerPoint, only one word per slide that was very convincing. You clearly practiced. So you had your story arc, you know, you had the inflection in your voice, blah, blah, blah. So we get really granular on what you did well. And the same way we get really granular on what you can improve on. You know, you didn't look people in the eye. Just get really specific so that people know exactly, you know, saying that was a bad job. I mean, some 
usually you know when you sucked, right? But you don't know what to I improve sure do. On. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but you may not know what to improve on. Exactly yeah. what should you do to be better? And so we train our people from the very beginning. Everyone, you know, people give critiques regardless of level. Um, to be able to be comfortable to say your ba- your body language was very negative. Your eye contact didn't help you tell your story. Your slides were crowded and I couldn't, I was just, and you're just reading from them, you know, so that it's very, very specific. And you have to get used to that, right? And you have to get used to saying great job, going from great job to good use of eye contact to from bad job to needs improvement to here's what you need to improve. And when you can practice it in a pretty low risk situation around training, like a presentation when everybody's doing it, mm-hmm. then that sort of translates over uh, into the one-to-one. On the conflict resolution, we really, we actually have a, I call it the communication wheel. It's based on some work done out of Georgetown University on how to sort of separate out facts, assessments, feelings, um, so that you can have a productive conversation that is a relationship conversation. So for instance, Adam, you're always late and man, it pisses me off and it, oh God, just wasting my time. I'm so mad at you because you're late. So instead of just starting with Adam, so mad at you, right? Where could you possibly go? You can't go anywhere. Right. All you can go is like out the door, right? Or you can escalate back to me. Yeah, you're mad at me. I'm even more mad at you, right? And instead it's, let me, we meet you. So Adam, I really need to have a conversation with you. We call it a circle conversation. I'd like to have that in the next 24 or 48 hours. When works for you to do this, right? And so one, it's not just like springing it on the person. Yeah. And two, it's, uh, which is respectful, right? Mm-hmm. And two, it's fitting into his or her schedule, not just yours. And then it's, um, thanks for meeting with me, Adam. Listen, the fact is that you have shown up at 970, you know, 957, 854, whatever the hell it is, right? Whatever the facts are for the last five meetings, right? Um, and you have been, uh, you've shown up after the meeting has started, which is a fact. You are late is actually not a fact that is subjective. So being really specific, what is the fact? Mm -hmm. Then the assessment. My assessment is you could care less about me. You have no respect for us as a team. And you're just like showing up because you have to. And I'm pissed. My feeling is I'm really mad because I'm, you know, you're, you're causing us all to slow down. I like to get out of here and do my own thing. Blah, blah, blah. And, um, so my request to you is that you show up on time. You be there when we're ready to start. So if the meeting starts at 10, that you show up at 9.59 with a pencil in your hand ready to roll. And I offer to you is to go over what I expect of you at the beginning of the week on making sure you understand where the meetings are that I require your attention. So we're asking the other person to change their behavior, Right. But yes. we're also offering help to help them change their behavior that you have asked them for. And it needs to be a reasonable ask, which is being on time is a reasonable ask. In general, what I find is most of the time, like the majority of the time, the assessment is wrong. We're all wrong on our assessments because we get churned up in our feelings. So <clears throat> it could be, Lee, oh my God, I thought I was early. I thought those meetings started at 10, 15, not at 10. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I had no idea, right? And it just p- puts a pin in the balloon of my, all my anger, right? Yeah, right. So, or, yeah, you know, and then if you do have the, you know what? I don't have any respect for you. Well, that's a whole different conversation, right? But you get to the you get to the, the nub of it really fast. And this way you can use your feelings effectively um, because particularly for women who were always told, don't bring your feelings to work. Don't bring your feelings to work. Men hate it when you cry. Men don't like it when you bring your feelings to work. It's the most ineffective um, uh, experience. In my experience, it's the most ineffective advice you can ever give somebody because we are human and we have feelings. So how, but the point is how to use it and to use facts that everyone can agree on and then talk about your assessment of it, which then yields to your feelings. Um, and then in the relationship, it is a request and an offer. So that we train a lot on that, right? We train a lot on that. Um, and for instance, today, if someone says, oh my God, uh, you know, Liz is pissing me off. And I'll just say, have you circled that? The answer is usually no. And I said, well, go circle it and then come back to me. And then they go off 
And usually I don't ever hear about it again because they resolve it themselves. Uh, and I think that's the next leadership piece is to not solve things, not solve everything for your people, but to give them the tools and to remind them of the process so that they can solve each other, solve them things, solve those problems themselves. I that was a lot of talking. Sorry, Adam. Oh, it's great. <laughs> uh, well, so that's the real stuff there. I mean, it's, it's how to do the thing that most managers are pretty challenged by. And that's given constructive feedback to people in a way that actually gets them to listen and act versus just react emotionally and, and, and put the defenses up. Um, mm -hmm. powerful, powerful stuff. I want to uh, wrap up here and talk about the podcast, Millennial Minded. Uh, I'm, you know, reviewing the uh, the episodes. You're up up in the 70s now. It's a, you know, 15 to, you know, 20 minute or so episode, completely digestible. I want to talk about the target and, and what you're uh, looking to do with this podcast because I'm, I'm looking at these episode titles and I love it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> If, if you're about to give your elevator pitch, dot, dot, dot. If you're mm -hmm. curious about dating a coworker uh, and uh, what to do if your boss is an asshole, um, <laughs> if you're interested in getting the most out of your job. I mean, th we're talking real world street level advice for the incoming uh, mm -hmm. generation of worker. Uh, tell me about this. This this looks awesome. So this, this podcast is the second career advice podcast that we've had at Double Forte. And the first one was called Everything Speaks which is more about how everything you do tells a story and, you know, how do you need to compose yourself in the workplace? In the middle of that was a section called Millennial Minded, where two of my younger people would basically make fun of my first part of the podcast interview. <laughs> ha, I love it. <laughs> and, um, and then when, you know, the, the, you know, keeping up a podcast is a lot of work, as you know, and I think we got to like 150 episodes of that. And, you know, it was just challenging to keep the caliber high without a lot of work. Um, and people we were getting a lot more response on the millennial minded piece than we were on the interview si on either side of it. So basically what we did was uh, we went to podcast movement or something and we had a lot of people there um, critique it for us. And like, this great is conference, by the way, isn't that we, a great yeah. conference? Oh, yeah. So millennial minded, like, this is really cool, right? They really love the fact that I let, I, as the CEO, let, these two younger people make fun of me for four or five minutes of every show. So basically we blew that out and, and it was, and basically it is all the questions. It started with all the questions that we had gotten through everything speaks like, uh, you know, what, what things that you just said, I hate my boss. He's such a jerk, you know, or an asshole, whatever it was. We tried to use the language that people asked us in. Um, and so then we broke it down to one topic per episode specifically, you know, actually answering a question somebody had. Um, and sometimes it's about, you know, what do I do if I want to get a raise or what if I hate my boss or what if I want to quit and all this kind of stuff. And then uh, one of the hosts, I had two hosts, and then I was the interviewee. They would ask me my, adv my advice. Like if you were, if this, and it's basically, it was what the CEO will t won't tell you because you won't bother to ask her or him. And I was just telling it straight from my point of view of having been a CEO for, or a president for over 20 years. I love it. Uh, that's the Millennial Minded available wherever podcasts are hosted, I assume. Correct. All right. MillennialMindedPodcast.com. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a wrap. I want to thank uh, Lee for being on the show here today. Uh, this is the Best Team Wins podcast where we're featuring entrepreneurs whose exceptional approach to the people side of their business has led to exceptional results. My name is Adam Robinson founder of Hierology and author of the book, The Best Team Wins, which you can find online at www.thebestteamwins.com. Lee, it was a blast. Thank you so much for being here today. Adam, so much fun. Thank you. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in and we will see you here next week. Thanks for listening to the Best Team Wins podcast with Adam Robinson. You can find out more information about Adam and his book, The Best Team Wins, Building Your Business Through Predictive Hiring at thebestteamwins.com. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next week.